I preach to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So this is the way it works. As a young couple in the church, when Leandra and I first came here, we were about to get married. People were really excited. You guys did a great job of throwing us parties, giving us little wedding gifts and whatnot. And, then, and so this is what was supposed to happen. We were supposed to get married, come back from a great honeymoon. We would get a week of just being a normal married couple. And then you all were supposed to start asking us when we were going to have kids. <laughs> and, and everyone said, you know, people are just going to be asking you all the time, when are there going to be babies? I want to see babies, babies, babies. Now, my parents have done this, but you so far have, have kind of like given us a little bit of a break. So I give you my most honest things. But with that being said, um, Leandra and I are talking about having kids in the next few years. So like it's just like on our radar. And we're starting to pay very close attention um, to how people say you should raise your children. And I see one, this great theme in this, is everyone is absolutely convinced that they have the right way to raise children. And that's about the only commonality. Um, <laughs> The, for example, um, Linda and John Schenkel, who are wonderful members here, who, by the way, if you don't show up to church, I'm going to preach about you. So, uh, <laughs> you should sit right there and they're not right there. Um, so they just had their first grandchild, and Linda was telling me that when she was a mother, they were like, you cannot let a baby sleep on its back. Absolutely. That's the worst thing you can do for, like, all of these very scientific, rational reasons. And, uh, and then now they, they've reversed. Like, you cannot let a child be on the stomach for too long, except for exactly one half hour a day, which will blah, 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 blah. Well, we were so sure just not that long ago that the exact opposite was true. And now we're so adamant that this is true. And then so I'm just curious, like, what the books will tell me uh, what to do when I have a child. And I'm just going to kind of remember that people have been raising children since, I don't know, forever. And, uh, and it'll all kind of work. Um, but in, in my very subtle kind of passive attention and research in this, um, I, 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 I came across advice on how to deal with kids who say they're about to run away. And then this happens to most kids, where they just get so frustrated with whatever is going on in the household, justified or not, that they make this grand statement, I'm going to go run away. I am done with you all. And I'm going to go pack up my teddy bear and uh, my Buzz Lightyear little action figure and uh, maybe a can of Coke, and I should be fine. And, um, and, then, and then, so this is the advice that uh, children used to get. You would ask the child, um, oh, okay, um, so, so where are you going to sleep? Um, and, then, and then the child says, well, I don't really know. I was sitting there just going to look out. And they're like, oh, okay. Because it might get cold. How are you going to stay warm? And then you start asking all of these questions. You use uh, a reason to show the child that what they're doing is just unreasonable. And, uh, and then they decide to stay. And then everything's fine. But that's wrong. And I'm actually convinced that that is objectively wrong. And uh, this is what child psychologists uh, say that you should now say to a child that proclaims that they're about to run away. No. That's it. No, because you being part of this family is not something that is reasonable. It's not something that's rationally true. You belong to me, and I belong to you. We are a family. And that is good enough within itself. I am not complete without you, and you are not complete without me. And we need to be together. I need you. And this is what belonging to the truth looks like. Belonging to the truth is not something that I can explain to you. It's not something I can go up to someone who, who may have no affiliation with the church whatsoever that might be so hurt and want to stay far away from religion as possible that they can't hear it. I can't just say, like, let me explain this to you, X, Y, and Z, and then you get it. No. That's not the way it works. I belong to the truth because I'm compelled to. That I am not complete 
without belonging to the truth, that I am drawn into it, just in the same way that I belong to my family, and that my children, when they come eventually, will belong to me, and I will belong to them. This is how belonging to the truth works. And in our society today, that emphasizes the individual so much that we want to make everything about your personal decision. That with enough research and blah, 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 that you will figure out what you belong to. You will figure out what's objectively true, and you'll be fine. Well, no. I belong to something that is so much bigger than myself that I can't even describe it to you in its wholeness, but I am drawn to it. When I want to be closer with Christ and when I want to draw nearer to that truth, when I want to dwell in the kingdom of God, it's not something that's informed by reason. It's something that is fundamentally part of who I am. I can't help it. But this is very different than the kingdom of God that they were expecting when Jesus came into the world. They were imagining something that looked very much like the court that Pontius Pilate likely sat in with Jesus, or the second coming of David, sitting on a high throne, proclaiming judgments across the land that will have power over all of the dominions and principalities and so forth and so forth. And then so it's almost ironic that Jesus is sitting in a seat of judgment. Not where he's judging, but where he's being judged. Being judged by someone who's not even a believer. Being judged by authorities of the world rather than heaven. Everyone wanted and expected Jesus to be sitting on that throne, but instead it's Jesus that is being judged. And Jesus proclaims that my kingdom is not of this world. This is not good news for Jesus' followers. They were expecting Jesus to come into worldly power, but instead he gives us a hint of what his kingdom might be about. Jesus' kingdom is about conquering death. It's about loving your neighbor as yourself, and it's about loving God above all others. channel, and I just watch that little crawl on the bottom. I'm given a lot of reasons to hope for the Jesus that they were expecting. The world seems to be a mess, and it seems to be very, very scary. ISIS is gaining ground. The chances of us having a civil election again seems less and less hopeful. All of the civility that I was taught would last forever as a child seems to be fraying at the seams. And it's scary. And I just want Jesus to come in, sit on his high throne, proclaim judgments, and make everything right again. But this is not the kingdom that Jesus Christ is Lord of. Jesus Christ is Lord over so much more. All the political institutions in the world are ultimately going to fail at some point. We will never come up with a perfect way of existing. Yes, we can make progress and we should strive for progress. But there's so much more to life. There's so much more to human relationship. There's so much bigger questions that we need to face. And it's Jesus that can walk with us along the way, that can welcome us into his kingdom, that can prove that compassion and peace will rule over all in due time. And even today, here at Trinity, I saw little glimpses of the kingdom of God, and it was not found on the news. I got to see two middle school girls who hadn't seen each other in a long time at the parish breakfast just embrace each other with just the peace.
pure joy of seeing each other once again. And in the chapel right there at 8 o'clock, I'm not sure if you've ever been to worship there at 8 o'clock. You should. It's really different and kind of cool. But I face away from the congregation when I'm celebrating the Eucharist. And then when it got to the point for the big amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, everyone said amen. And I heard this tiny little voice that was late saying amen. And I, it was Clara, Tripp and Rakia's daughter that had snuck in for worship. And it just filled me with so much joy in the sincerity of her desire just to be there and see those little hands come up and excitedly receive communion. I also see the kingdom of God when we mourn. It's not always about joy. Because that sadness, that longing to be with those who have gone before us, though we do have hope in the resurrection, that does not make that pain any less real. And if anything, longing for someone we've lost can be very sacred as well. It's this that is the kingdom of God. That we belong to truth. That we belong to something much bigger than all of the political institutions and evil in this world. That we can overcome that and love each other more fully in the kingdom 